Good morning, church. Let's come before him and let's worship him. Let's thank him that God has granted another new day that we can worship him. Uh, I would like to read from Psalm 20 where uh, everybody will know, but I would like to read out these uh, scriptures. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifice and accept your burnt offering. May he give you the desire of your heart and may make all your plan success. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banner in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now, this I know, the Lord give victory to his anointed. He answered him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in Jared and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knee and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Amen. Let's worship him. And yes, we trust in the name of the Lord. you to to proclaim this song over your life over our situations that no matter what the doctor says about your health no matter what the scientist says about what is going to be happen no matter what people says but we will trust in the name of the Lord and as we sing this song you might if you don't know this song but with the word just proclaim over this song, over your life, over our life. And let's just sing one more time as a proclamation.
we trust we trust you lord we trust you jesus that you never leave us alone. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who give us, who give, who wanted to give the best to your children. Oh Lord, we thank you. You are the God who wanted to do the best for your children and for the nation, for the land. Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we honor you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that even as we hear your word from Pastor, Lord, I pray that you will anoint him and that, Lord, that you will speak to every one of us, that it will bring a refreshing, it will bring healing into our soul. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I trust that today will be a blessed Sunday for you. I bring you greetings from the little village of Kingston Seymour, where we are staying at the moment. We've just returned from the USA and we are doing 14 days of isolation. We are also at this time applying for our visas to return to India and would appreciate your prayers that these will be successful. It's a privilege for me to share God's word with you today, and we're continuing to look at what we started at last week, looking at the armor of God. And today we're going to talk about the belt of truth. So let's read together from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through to verse 14. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, 
Put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. You'll remember last week we spoke about fighting our battles from a point of victory. Verse 11 emphasizes that for us. We are strong in the Lord and his mighty power. We, have, we are overcomers because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He's won the victory. And this is a very important foundation to establish as we speak about the armor of God. We can get just so distracted about what the enemy is doing. But we need to remember we have victory and the war has been won and God gives us everything we need for the little battles that still need to be fought. And today we're looking and starting looking at the armor of God, looking at the belt of truth. In Romans chapter 13 verse 12, Paul tells us to put on the armor of light. And then obviously in Ephesians 6, he lists the complete armor for us. He begins this by talking about the belt of truth. This is the first and the most important item. In the version that uh, James Moffat has, he puts it this way. Tighten the belt of truth about your loins. Now God commands us to stand our ground courageously in the battle. We need to be confident in the battle. But what is this belt of truth? And what does Paul mean to have our loins gird about with it? The belt for the Roman soldier was a very different item to the belt that we know of today. Today we see the belt as something that's very fashionable. And often the belt is just an accessory that has no purpose. It's just to look fashionable. For many people, a belt doesn't even hold up their clothing any longer. It's just to look good. But for a soldier in the day of Paul, it was a critically important piece of their armor. It held all their baggy clothes together. Without it, they wouldn't be able to move properly. The clothing, their clothing would slip off. It held everything together. It was also vital to the Roman soldier because On it, almost every other part of armor depended for its security and its usefulness. The leather casing for his loins was held firm by that belt. From it hung the sword, the dagger, and all the other weapons. Lowit says this, Loose armor was troublesome and disturbing, making the soldier feel soft and awkward and unready and giving him a sense of going to pieces. Now, I remember when Karen first started trying to wear saris, she would attempt to put them on herself. She had little videos to show you how you put them on, but she was never, ever confident to go out with that sari. She always had the greatest fear that when she went out, her sari would just start unraveling in public. And so subsequent to that, she has always had somebody help her put her sari on and put the pins in the right place. Now it was the belt that held everything together for the soldier, giving them a sense of firmness, making them feel secure and able to meet the enemy's attack with confidence. We need to tighten the belt of truth around our minds as Christian. That's what's going to bring us stability. That's what will bring stability to our temperament. It will control our thoughts and it will control our speech. To wear the belt of truth is to walk straightforwardly in God's word without any deviation to the left or to the right. The Bible is the belt of truth. And as we hold firmly to it and tighten it around us and around our minds, we will walk in victory. The story is told of a young girl, a young college student who had some required reading. And she started reading the book for a particular course and found it very cumbersome and difficult to read. And she went through page by page, forcing herself 
to complete the book. After a few years, while she was working in her field of study, she met a young professor and they fell in love and they finally got engaged and they planned to marry each other. One night he came to visit her and when he visited her, he saw on her bookshelf this very boring and cumbersome book tucked away, collecting dust on the shelf. Pulling the book from the shelf, he quickly informed her that he had actually written the book. He had written it under an assumed name because the publisher had asked him to do that. Later that night, the lady picked up the book when he had gone and she started reading it. All night she sat up reading the book and to her surprise, the book seemed to be the most interesting book she had ever read. It wasn't dull. She found the book fascinating and intriguing. Well, what made the difference? The thing that made the difference was the fact that she now knew the author and she loved the author very much. And you know, when we become Christians, something similar occurs in our lives. The Bible, which formerly might have been a book that seemed rather boring or dull, suddenly becomes exciting and fascinating. And it's all because we love and we know the author. The truth of God's word needs to captivate our lives. That is the belt of truth. When we become followers of Jesus, we soon discover that we have a new enemy, and that is the devil, Satan. And with relentless consistency, Satan will bombard any Christian with temptations, trials, and sometimes persecutions. In short, the enemy declares war on each one of us. And we're told that God has already prepared us for those battles. We're told in this passage, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. In the Greek, that word put on is a military command. It means to be made capable or to be empowered. The tense that is used indicates that the armor doesn't need to be purchased. And we know that because it was purchased on the cross. And now it's laid out before us on the day we become a follower of Jesus Christ. The problem today is not that we don't have the resources to fight the enemy and all his cohorts. But the problem is that we don't use the resources that God has already given us. And that's why this is a command. Put on the armor of God. Get dressed for success. Get dressed for battle. The whole armor of God means don't leave one piece off. Now, let's come back to this belt of truth. We've already said that for the Roman soldier, the belt of truth was the most important item. What it did was it also held the breastplate in place. And so if the breast, breastplate sagged, all the vital organs, the lungs and the heart would be exposed and it would make him vulnerable. But this belt of truth held it in place. It also had a clip on it for the shield and the shield rested on it for the protection of the soldier. And it had a clip on it where the soldier hung his sword for his defense. So when Paul says God has given us the belt of truth, what he is saying is that truth is foundational in your life. And without the truth, the word of God, the enemy will always have an advantage over you. That is why one of Satan's strategies in our lives is to try and sweep away the importance of the Bible. He doesn't want to see us to know how important God's word is for us. And often we get sidetracked by doing things we don't have to do and we don't land up reading the word of God. Sometimes it's not all bad. Sometimes we're listening to great Christian preachers on TV. Sometimes we're reading great Christian books. But I want to say to you, as much as those can be valuable for us, nothing compares to the Word of God and reading the Word of God and letting it infiltrate your mind. 
the belt for the soldier had held everything together. And in the same way, God's truth is the stabilizing and securing hinge of our lives that holds everything together, even when in the world we're living in, everything seems to be falling apart. God's word holds us together. And we need to give God's word the central and dominant place in our lives that it needs. The Greek word for truth in this passage is a rather peculiar word that is used. The word truth here is aletheia, which refers to something that has been laid tangibly and clearly before our eyes. It means it is not concealed any longer. It's tangibly there before our eyes. In our spiritual life, you will know that there are many things that are real that you cannot see with your fleshly eyes. God is with us wherever we are. Today, God is with you. And yet I cannot show you visibly where God is with your eyes. You may sense his presence and you may be touched by his spirit, but I can't show him visibly to you. But with the truth, God chose to do something absolutely awesome. He chose to take the words of his mouth that are always true and he chose to make them athelia, to make them visible to us. The Bible is the one spiritual weapon that God has laid out visibly and tangibly before our eyes. The Bible is the only weapon that God permitted to pass through the spiritual realm into the physical realm so that we might use it. It's a weapon that we can use. We can see it with our eyes. We can hold it with our hands. We can read it with our tongues. We can hide it in our hearts. We can keep it as our possession. This is significant and it should elevate the importance and the value of God's word for each one of us. The Bible that you are reading is not just a mere book. It's a weapon that you can use in the struggles of life. Here in tangible form, in black and white, are the words of God. that God breathed and they bring us victory. Reading the Bible daily is vital to the Christian because it gives us power. It gives the Christian victory over the strategies of Satan. That's why in verse 11 it says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Now the Bible uses three words here relating to Satan's strategies that help us see how the power of God's word in our life will bring us victory. The first word that it uses is it talks about the wiles, or in the Greek, the methodos, from which we get the English word method. So God's word help, helps us to stand strong against the methods of the devil. Satan wants to trick your mind. He's crafty and he's subtle. He seeks to place little thoughts lies, little seeds of deception in our minds, like he did with Eve. Did God really say? He gives her half a truth. But daily reading of God's word reveals Satan's methods and allows us to stand firm against them. When we read the Bible, we're reading truth. The Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. When he speaks lies, he speaks in his native language. And how do we deal with that? We deal with that with the truth. And we have the truth. We have God's word. And the next word that is used is devices or nomata. It's simply, it's a very similar word to the word wiles of the devil. And the word devices means confusion of the mind or confusion of the intellect. Satan seeks to confuse our minds. He wants to play mind games with us. He wants to trick the mind and confuse it. Our defense against that is the truth of God's word. And that will always be our greatest defense. The third word that is used here is to deceive. The Greek word planeo. The word similar to wiles and devices. And this word actually means to roam around like planets roam around. So Satan wants your mind to be out in orbit. He wants your mind to roam off in the wrong direction. 
How do you bring your, your life back in line with God? How do you bring your minds captive and your thoughts captive? Through the truth of God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now that word furnished actually means to fit completely or to be completely geared up for all good works. There's a word picture here and that word picture provides us with a picture of a fully armed soldier who is ready for battle. He's dressed for the battle, completely outfitted for the war at hand. And he believes confidently he will have victory. The word of God gives us victory over the enemy. As Christians, we need to know the Bible. The more we know of God's word, the more we will live in victory. We have it. Do we use it? I love the scripture in John 8.32. It says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth liberates us. God's word sets us free. When you were bound with shackles and chains before you knew Jesus Christ and were a follower of Christ, it was God's word, his truth, that set you free. And today he continues to set us free through the truth of his word. He liberates us. As followers of Jesus, the armor has been purchased for us with the blood of Jesus on the cross. It's been laid out before us and we're commanded to wear it. Do you tighten the belt of truth around your mind and your intellect daily? Do you get into what God's word every single day? If not, why? Are you a follower of Christ? Have you received him as your Lord? If you haven't, why not make that life-changing decision today? If you are a follower of Christ, I trust that today you might have a new understanding of the importance of God's word in our lives. It holds us together. It, on God's word, we have absolutely everything we need for life, for godliness. We can live our lives in victory as we hold on to his word. And we can have victory over Satan and over sin. And I will pray that you will come to love God's word more and more. And tighten that belt of truth around your minds and intellect. The Lord bless you. Good morning, Union Church. It's good to be with you as we come before the Lord's table this morning. In the past few weeks I've been with you, we've been doing something very interesting where we've taken Paul's instruction to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we've been walking backwards through the text, looking at each verse and letting it show us the beauty of why we take the Lord's Supper. And by way of review, if you're joining us for the first time, we started in verse 27, where Paul gave a warning not to come before the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner. He warns us to examine ourselves, to confess any unrepented sin before the Lord. If there's a relationship with a brother or sister that needs to be mended and reconciled, to do that before partaking of the Lord's Supper. The next week we looked at verse 26, where Paul says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The significance there is we're proclaiming the gospel to the world. We're saying, indeed, we have a Savior, Jesus Christ has come. He's lived a perfect life. He's laid down that life. He's died in our place. He's risen again and he's coming again. The next week, last week, we looked at verse 25 where Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We looked at the significance of the old covenant. Now the people of Israel had to take an animal and symbolically lay their sin on that animal and sacrifice it 
As we know, life is in blood. Blood means life. And they had to shed the blood of the animal. They had to kill the animal in place of their sin. Well, Jesus, last week we saw, he said that I'm the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God. You no longer have to make sacrifices. I'm making the once and for all sacrifice that will appease God's wrath. He laid down his life and he spilled his blood. He gave his life, his perfect blood for us. And this week we're looking at verse 24 where Jesus said, And this is my body, which is for you. And so the significance of body here is that Jesus had a physical body. He indeed was the God-man. There's a theological word we use, it's a fancy word, the hypostatic union. What the hypostatic union means is that Jesus wasn't half God, half man. He wasn't a man who became God. No, he was 100% fully God from the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, eternally existing in the triune Godhead. And that he was 100% man. As John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And later on John says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when Jesus said, this is my body, he means this is my body. And the significance here is that we needed the God-man. We needed a man to lay down his life in our place. The sacrifice had to be of a man because it was man who made an offense to God. It was man who sinned against God. We'd been sacrificing bulls and sheep, and those sacrifices were only for a temporal time. They weren't once and for all. So we needed a man to take our place because it was man who sinned against God. But no man existed who fully obeyed God's law. So we needed the God-man. We needed fully God. The only person who lived in full obedience to the law of God was Jesus Christ, was God. Also, it had to be the God-man, had to be man on the cross, but the only person who can endure the full wrath of God is God himself. And so we needed God to be man. And so that's why we praise Jesus and we honor him by taking the Lord's Supper, by saying, Jesus, you did give your body for us. You were a man. And the other significance, I want to give you an example that a professor of mine in Bible college gave me. He said, McClellan, you know, Hebrews talks about Jesus being the great high priest, our mediator. If I told you there were two men who were lifting a great weight, let's say a, a thousand kilograms, and one man could not lift the weight, but one man could lift the weight, who knows actually how heavy that weight is? The man who couldn't lift the weight knows it was really heavy. But he doesn't know how heavy. He couldn't lift the weight. The man who could lift the weight knows how heavy it was because he was able to lift it. Well, that's Jesus. We think we know the depths of our sin. We think we know the struggle, the strife, the temptation we go through. But Jesus knows it far greater than we do because he took it upon himself and he was able to carry it. He lived a perfect life and he endured the cross and the wrath of God in our place. He is indeed our great high priest, our mediator. He knows exactly what we're going through. And so that's why we can come to the Lord's table saying, Jesus, we want to proclaim that you are indeed the Savior, the God-man. And so we do so by as he instructed us. We take the bread as he took the bread. We give thanks and we break it. And Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember to me. Take and eat. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the new covenant given for you. Take and drink. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you indeed were the God man. You are God incarnate, fully God, fully man. You came to this earth, you lived a perfect life and you laid that life down. You gave your body on the cross and your blood, your perfect blood was shed for your people. You appease the full wrath of God, and we thank you for that. By doing what we do every Sunday morning, by remembering the sacrifice you made on the behalf of your people. So we want that sacrifice to live richly in our hearts. So we do so every Sunday by taking the Lord's Supper and every day proclaiming that our Savior has come, he's lived and he's died, and he's coming again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long to be reunited with you and to praise your name forever and eternity. We lift you high, Jesus. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. Have a good week, Union Church. Be blessed.